Welcome to a very special Tuesday talk here at the Berkman Klein Center here at Pound Hall across the street from the Berkman Klein Center. Um, as with a lot of our events on campus, this is being live webcast and recorded. Please just keep that in mind uh, when, if and when you ask questions, which I hope you will uh, toward the end. I have the privilege and the pleasure of being able to introduce Professor Susan Crawford and Chairman Tom Wheeler this afternoon. As I'm sure you know, Professor Crawford teaches here at HLS, works with us a lot in the cyber law clinic, and works a lot on issues related to telecom, and, as well as civic innovation, government innovation, and helping cities think through data smart governance uh, and policies. And uh, joining Susan today, uh, Chairman Tom Wheeler, who spent three decades working in telecom on both the business side and the law and policy side. In November of 2013, he was appointed by President Obama to the position of FCC chairman, where he was unanimously confirmed. And his tenure uh, at F as FCC chair was one of extraordinary accomplishment on a wide range of issues uh, and is particularly well known for ushering in the FCC's final rule on net neutrality in April of 2015, which I'm sure is one of many things that Susan and uh, Chairman Wheeler will talk about. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Professor Ca Crawford and uh, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Bye. indeed a signal pleasure and honor to have Tom Wheeler here as the country goes through this whirlwind of the last few days. The 31st uh, FCC chairman, a proud graduate of The Ohio <laughs> State University and a recipient. You got that right, the. the. Ohio State University and a recipient of its alumni medal. A former uh, president and chairman of the National Archives Foundation, a student of history, cares about America's documents and America's future and America's past. And the most consequential FCC chairman since a 35-year-old Newt Minow went to the Sheraton Park Hotel, to the Lion's Den, to the National Association of Broadcasters in 1961, the beginning of the Kennedy administration, and told those broadcasters that they were supposed to be serving the public interest. Interesting concept. Isn't, isn't that, that something? Know? So. Tom Wheeler told four companies that want to control our destinies that they should be serving the public interest as well. And uh, has was active on a huge range of issues, as Chris mentioned. So Tom, I know that um, someone you revered was your uh, grandfather. Mm -hmm. Pretend you're speaking to your grandfather right now, someone with absolute compassion and affection for you. And tell him what you're really proud of in your tenure at the FCC. Oh, golly, Susan. What are you really proud of? What'd you do? So, yeah, I think that, that, that I think we did a lot of things. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> you did. And, but let's start with the base. You notice what I said? We did we, yes. a lot of things. Okay. Because okay? what I am most proud of is the team that did these things. You know, I mean, here's the silly thing. You're chairman, you're the guy who, you know, ends up in the newspaper or in front of the Congress or whatever the case may be. But you're just the band leader. I mean, the people who are making the music and playing the instruments are the people who are doing the real work. Okay. And, um, and uh, we were just incredibly fortunate to be able to attract to the commission um, a team of new senior folks, uh, bureau chiefs, uh, folks in the office of the chairman, general counsel, uh, etc., to work with a really strong staff. I mean, there are really dedicated, really bright, really caring people on the staff of the FCC. So what am I proudest about? You know, I got to work with them. I mean, I, 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 so I went around on the last couple of days and I met with every bureau. And I, I had one thing that I said in common to, to all of them. <clears throat> and that was that, that I was proud of the fact that I was able to say I was their colleague. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot to be proud of in that agency. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, I think you have to put everything in perspective because it basically boils down to it's all about people. Mm -hmm. Now, 
really what you were going for is How do you know? let's talk about net neutrality, let's talk about well, privacy, no, let's talk actually, about e-rate, let's talk about... I wanted to put the personal angle on it, okay. like the, the, okay. real, the, the human pride here. But, but really it only important. happens because of the people, you know. Yeah. So you mentioned a small struggling educational institution called The Ohio State <laughs> University. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school there, I was assistant alumni director and my job was the care and feeding of Woody Hayes. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it was a fabulous <laughs> experience. That, that's, that's an overstatement. My job, my job was that, that I, would, uh, I, I traveled the state with the coaches, including Woody. And so I got to know Woody Hayes up close and personal, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it, it was, son, yes, coach, <laughs> you know? Um, but Woody used to say, you win with people. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more true than that. You win with people. And so the reason why we're able to get some things done, so we had really good, really dedicated people who busted their ass, who believed in things and busted their ass. Let me tick off a few things then. Okay. Um, uh, bringing fiber access to about 50% of America's schools, the up, you know, the more upgrade. More than that. More than that, we're above 50 now? So here's where we are. When I came in, two thirds of the schools in America did not have fiber connections. Yeah. And the third that did, did not have Wi-Fi. Only half of them had Wi-Fi to the student's desk. Mm -hmm. The latest report out of Education Superhighway says that 90% of the school districts in America now have 100, that's the standard of 100 megabits to, per student to the student's desk. Terrific. That's because of a team that worked together to overhaul a program that had originally been envisioned by Al Gore, mm -hmm. but had atrophied um, as a narrowband program that wasn't making sense in a broadband world. Um, but no, I'm very proud of that. Big one, and revolutionizing the idea of subsidizing low-cost phone service, changing that over to high-speed internet access. Right. That's a and big that, deal. And that's, that's uh, so, so we've always had a program where, um, well, it started in the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. but we had a program that, that, that subsidized um, low-income Americans to be able to have phones surface because how are you gonna dial 911, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, but same story, it had atrophied as dial-up telephone service when the world had gone broadband. So how do we make sure that the same kind of concept supports subsidies for low-income Americans for broadband. But the champion for that was Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. She was the person who was constantly, constantly pushing on that, and mm -hmm. she, was, she was my conscience on that issue. Mm. It's a wonderful issue. And there's some things that didn't happen before we get to the Title II discussion. The Comcast Time Warner Cable merger. So, uh, yes. Um, that didn't happen. It didn't and, happen. And, and T Mobile uh, Sprint. T Mobile didn't happen. Sprint's another one that didn't happen. Um, we had uh, dinner last night with the former assistant attorney general for antitrust, Bill Baer, and his deputy, Renata Hesse, and then uh, my two key folks who had been involved, uh, Phil Brevere and John Sallet. Um, and we had dinner to reflect on not only the substance of the issues we had worked on, but again, back to this people angle. Mm -hmm. I don't think there'd ever been a better working relationship between the antitrust division and the FCC because we all shared a common belief and we all liked each other mm -hmm. and liked working together with each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of learning on both sides yeah. from everything I've heard. Yeah. A lot of information yeah. traded around. No, big, 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 I mean, there was some, the, the Comcast Time Warner decision um, broke some new ground. Mm -hmm. uh, privacy? So, um, there's a really simple issue that, that, that I think that, that, that we're going to have to face again because of the new administration. And that is that Privacy is a civil rights issue of the 21st century, of the connected era. Um, let me give you an example of it. So, so we, had, we had, for decades, rules that um, applied to telephone companies 
that said that the information that was transmitted in order to set up the call could not be used by the telephone company. So for instance, if I call Air France, Verizon can't turn around and sell that information to some tour operator or hotel company in Paris. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but that doesn't exist in the broadband world. So you had that strange situation where your smartphone, <coughs> if you used it to make a voice call, your privacy was protected. If you use that same device and the same network to go on the web and go to the Air France website, boom, that information was for sale. It was not your information anymore. The very fact that you had used the network meant you were giving that information away. And we said, no, this is the consumer's information. And so we put a rule in place that said that the consumer gets to make the choice as to how the network is going to use the information. Um, and that was another one of our three to two votes. We'll talk about party line in a bit. I, I want to get there. I'm still ticking off the great okay, the take moments take of the Tom Do you want me to Wheeler quit talking about era. it? <laughs> and um, uh, the idea of labeling an internet service provider as a common carriage Title II entity, that was pretty big. Mm -hmm. And um, what was it like? Okay, I've always wanted to know. What is it like to hear from 3.7 million Americans? <laughs> what does that feel like? Well, they, they crashed our servers. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and, and, uh, and you don't always want to hear everything they say about you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've heard more descriptions about what I could do to myself with a pineapple than I uh, <laughs> ever want to hear. <laughs> but, um, but the whole... The whole open internet discussion and debate was, a, was, was fascinating. And, and, and for me, um, and you were part of this because you and I were on the phone discussing this. Um, for me, it was kind of a Damascus Road experience. Mm -hmm. um, so you go back and let's put it in, in, in perspective that um, twice before the commission had tried to do something, and twice before the broadband companies, the carriers, appealed it to the court, and the court said, no, you can't do that. And so, let's see, I walked in in November, and in February, the court came down with a Verizon decision that threw out the previous attempts at open internet. And, um, and it seemed to me that the court was leading us in a certain direction built around Section 706 and uh, protecting what's the virtuous circle of, of if you have good broadband, that will drive more services, which will drive more broadband, and the job of the commission is to protect that. So initially my, my proposal was that we should follow what I thought the court was trying to signal to us. At the same point in time, I asked in the, in the notice of proposed rulemaking, asked about Title II and, and other ideas. Um, it became clear over the debate, that the discussion, that that wasn't going to be sufficient. The 706 wasn't going to be sufficient. And, um, and uh, you know, people like to point to, uh, to uh, John Oliver and, you know, all the, I, I, I will show you one thing here that this, my, my daughter gave me. This is my, oh, that's great. This is my cell phone uh, case that says, I am not a dingo. <laughs> Um, That's great. Uh, but um, uh, but the dingo uh, is inherently funny, no matter what. Ding dingo yeah. is inherently funny <laughs> until you stand up and say, you know, I have decided I'm not a dingo. <laughs> That's not funny. Do not mess with a guy who is funny for a living. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but so one of the things that, that that you and Chris didn't mention in my background is that I was I was the CEO of the Wireless Industry Association mm -hmm. for a dozen years. And in uh, 1994, 1993, the wireless industry went to Congress and said, please make us a common carrier. But be, and put us under Title II. 
But because Title II was designed for a different era with different technology, less competition, et cetera, remove a lot of these old requirements that, are in, that were in Title II. And Congress did that, and the commission followed through, and the wireless industry went like this. And so, you know, in the summer of, of 2014, I guess, I'm going through options, and it's kind of, wait a minute. Section 332 of the Communications Act, which is, which is this structure that I just described for the wireless industry, is the perfect model for this. Yes, you, can, you should be a common carrier with all the responsibilities that come with being a common carrier, but at the same point in time, you can forbear from some of the more ridiculous things. I mean, you know, the statute says you've got a, a, accounting rules and who's on your board and who you can buy from and all kinds of things, uh, including ex ante price regulation, okay? Um, and uh, we can forbear from that. And let's take that as the model of how we implement Title II in a broadband world. And that was the decision that, that we ended up uh, making. Um, the, we, were, we were constantly working through the various iterations uh, of it. Um, the president, of course, came out and said that he was a strong Title II uh, uh, supporter. Uh, and, uh, and so we were able to put together three votes You've and uphold it in court. How about that? A very strong decision. There, with yeah. a very strong decision yeah. that, was, that it is, was, it was, was crucial for the So third time, we got it right because we did it this way, and the court strongly agreed with us. So I've got a quote from you, recent uh -oh. speech. You've said recently, those who build and operate networks have both the incentive and the ability to use the power of the network to benefit themselves, even if doing so harms their own customers and the greater public interest. We're hearing from the Trump administration today that they're looking forward to getting rid of 75% of regulations. On the, the idea is that they inevitably dampen innovation and investment. What's your view of that claim, the dampening of investment by regulation? <clears throat> so, part of my experience is that I've made the same argument when I was an advocate. How about that? So, let me tell you a story. Um, I was CEO of the Wireless Industry Association, and I, I was proud of the job that I did both at, uh, at the Cable Association when we were taking on the broadcasters and they were trying to shut us down, and in the early days of wireless when I was at, the, at, at, at CTIA. The least proud moment of my public policy life was when I opposed the commission's efforts to um, have local number portability. So that if and that you did, means for humans. If you if you decided you could take your your if you wanted to switch your service from AT and T to T Mobile, that you could take your number with you. It didn't used to be that way, and that was imposed by regulation. And I opposed it, and you know, saying, okay, so I mean, how are we going to oppose this? You can't exactly go out and say, hey, you know, we think it's a really bad idea that consumers can't le can't leave us and they're trapped in their current carrier because they can't uh, they've given everybody their telephone number. That, that's not an argument that is a, a real winner. So, you, so, so the argument I made was, oh, this I I installing this is going to take money that should be spent on infrastructure and expanding connectivity. And, and, and um, fortunately, that didn't sell. <laughs> um, I, like I said, I regret that, that activity. Um, but, I'm, but I'm guilty of this. So the, it is going to slow down our incentive to invest is kind of the first line of defense of everybody. And it's balderdash. I cleaned that That's up. That's a strong word. I cleaned that up. <laughs> um, the reason that you invest is to get a return. Um, you don't 
say, well, I'm not going to invest because I might trigger some regulations. No, the question is, am I going to make a return off of this? Broadband is a high margin operation. Mm -hmm. You can make a return off of it. So, but the facts speak for themselves. Since the open internet rule went in place, broadband investment is up. Fiber connections are up. Usage of broadband is up. Investment in companies that use broadband is up. And get ready for it. Revenues in the broadband providers are up because people are using it more. The reason why you invest is for this reason, right? To generate more revenues and a good return on those revenues. And so, so the, oh my goodness, it's going to be a terrible thing for investment uh, is, is just kind of the first refuge that everybody looks at or everybody makes, and you have to look past that. As a student of the Civil War, you'll remember that one of the big prizes of 1863 was Chattanooga. Yes, ma'am. Railroad hub, three railroad lines, two big rivers, two mountain ranges. What role did Chattanooga play in your tenure as chair? <laughs> what a setup. You know, that was well done. <laughs> Thank you. That was real. You want to talk about the cracker line that brought we're, in the we're, supplies we're, after they uh, uh, did the siege? incredible story. We're going to get there. Okay. But let's start with something yeah. related to telecom. So, um, my good friend Susan Crawford says to me when I took this job that I should bear three things in mind. I wrote these down and I kept them on my desk. The first was to return the regulatory ideal, that there is a legitimate role for regulation to benefit the broad scope of the population. The second was that um, we should have a legitimate, credible definition of what broadband is, because broadband used to be defined as four megabits a second. You know, yeah. that's hardly broadband. Mm -hmm. um, and the third was to tackle the outrageous practices that the ISPs, the internet service providers, the telephone companies, the cable companies, were doing where they were going around the country and going to state legislatures and getting state legislatures to pass laws that prohibited cities in that state from building their own broadband network to compete with them. And, and you know, I thought, hey, you know, if the people, through their local government, decide they don't like the quality of service that they're getting, they ought to be able to organize through their government and say, I want something better, including the government building it. And so um, we sued. Chattanooga was the was the was the case study of of a Tennessee law. So we sued um, uh, North Carolina and, uh, I'm sorry, we sued Tennessee and North Carolina um, on with making the argument that um, this was a overreach of the state's authority. Unfortunately, the Sixth Circuit disagreed with us. But the great thing is all of the hubbub about this woke up an awful lot of cities, triggered an awful lot of referenda mm -hmm. to do things. And there is more activity to build competitive broadband at municipal levels than there ever has been. And you know what happens? You do know what happens. But of course what happens, I'm talking to Ms. Fiber here, I mean, yeah, come on, right. you know, that, that what happens is when they decide to build, it's just amazing. The cable company decides to go faster and expand mm -hmm. their service. It, I, you know, it's just incredible. I love this thing called competition. Mm. Private citizen Tom Wheeler, mm -hmm. the legislatures of Missouri and Virginia just introduced new snarling bills along these lines. What would you tell 
a sincere, earnest state legislator today about those bills? What would, would, would your like top two points be to that legislature? Well, I, I mean, first of all, that um, that that they are um, that the people do have a right to come together and say, "I want something better for my city." Mm -hmm. And the second political point that I would make yeah. is is it's not really the Chattanoogas where this is a big challenge. It's the Wilson, North Carolinas. Mm -hmm. And it's the areas where the people who voted for Donald Trump do not have access to the internet and are not getting access by the existing companies. And they're the ones who are fed up with the system and have voted to, 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 that, they, that they were fed up. And you need to be responsive to that. They would vote your way. They yes, have to. They right. have to. They I would hope. Well, you know. Because you were, I mean, that's a, we're still wrestling with this in such a big way that t you're 10 times more likely not to have access to reasonable high speed internet access in a rural area than in an urban area. And if we add together wires and wireless, you're just not going to get it in rural areas at all. So we have a lot, we have a lot of progress left and, to do. And, and, and this is the idea, I mean, I think that one of the messages that people were voting for in this campaign is I want power back. To me, right. I want decision. You know, the whole thing about drain the swamp is get the power back. If the government closest to the people is saying yeah. our people would like to have better broadband, mm -hmm. then who's to say no? Mm -hmm. We talked to you about the vision of the FCC because now we're going to go through the crossroads. I love looking back, but let's 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 walk on. Okay. Um, it, the design of it as a uh, FDR agency was it could be expert agency insulated from politics. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, many of the staffers, uh, people who are working at the FCC, are there, there's a lot of flow back and forth between the Hill. People who have been staffers end up as commissioners. Uh, lobbyists end up as staffers. There's a big circle here. What so do we do me, about let me, all that? Let me give a, I, you deserve a better response. Thank you, than, I appreciate than, that. Than the, than the smart ass response I gave yeah. you. Um, look, um, one of my aha moments was how special an independent agency is. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a story. Um, Early in my tenure, we said that for technology reasons, it was no longer necessary to turn off your cell phone on an airplane for fear of interfering with the ground stations, which is the only reason that rule existed. And you all remember the hubbub of Oh my God, we're going to be 35,000 feet and people are going to be, the guy next to me is going to be yakking away. I didn't want that either. <coughs> we were just doing a ruling on a technical issue. So Anthony Fox, the Secretary of Transportation, and I are on the phone because he has the responsibility to the FAA of how consumers behave on the plane. I was just doing the technology. You don't need, because it doesn't interfere anymore because they put Pico cells on the plane. Um, and he says, well, this is cool. We can work this all out. He said, you take the technology. I'll take the consumer. We'll solve it. I said, that's fabulous. I said, I'm testifying tomorrow in Congress at 10 o'clock. Um, and they're going to ask about this. Let's make sure that we've got our, uh, our, our language down as exactly what you and I have just agreed to. He says, our staffs will work on that. That's great. About an hour later, Somebody comes in, one of my staff folks comes in and says, well, I just got a call from the general counsel at Department of Transportation. They can't do it. Why? It was overruled by the White House. Hmm. Now, make a very long story short, there was somebody in the communication shop at the White House that didn't like this idea. The White House ended up approving it. I went and testified, you know, things moved forward. But the point of the matter is that I made the decision looking at the guy in the mirror in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the cabinet secretary had to run it through the apparatus of the White House. And as a former White House staffer, you know how that works. Mm -hmm. so, so the ability to have an independent agency 
to make to, to be an expert agency and to make independent judgments is really important. That does not mean that it isn't a political agency, which was your, your question. And in particular, having an agency that for the vast majority of my term was dealing with a Republican Congress that didn't like what we were doing. Um, that had a that, that helped politicize um, the activities at the commission. The um, so it, it's it, it is a it is it is an independent agency um, that of course the commissioners read the newspapers like the land of the Supreme Court. Right, the Supreme Court reads election. I mean, was, they you know they respond to letters. From Congress. It's an agency made up historically of one agency being glued together with uh, memories of another agency, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, now people are talking about taking it apart. Mm -hmm. Modernizing the FCC is the uh, lingo being used. What's your thought about that? It's a fraud. Keep, um, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it's interesting. So I, I actually I was going through some papers this weekend. And I ran across a September 2013 article in the Washington Post, the headline of which was something to the effect, here's how the networks plan to defang the FCC. And it quoted all of the, the, the cable and telephone company uh, off Washington office heads saying that really the, the consumer protection and competition work of the FCC should be transferred to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And, um, and it's no surprise why they want it to transfer there. The, the, the FTC doesn't have rulemaking authority. They've got enforcement authority. And their enforcement authority is whether or not something um, is, is unfair or deceptive. So first, the only regulation that they would be subject to would be a, a, an adjudicatory finding that, uh, that it's unfair or deceptive, one. Two, you got this agency over here, the FCC, that is constantly worrying about all things in telecom, the FTC has to worry about everything from computer chips to bleach labeling. Mm -hmm. And of course you'd want to get lost in that morass where, okay, well, we'll get to that, but we've got to get the bleach labeling taken care of first. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and so this was their strategy all along. So what's, what surprises me, what, no, what doesn't surprise me is that then the Trump transition team, which are basically folks from American Enterprise Institute, who were folks who it's just were true. It's not even funny. It's who just were true. who were longtime supporters <laughs> of this concept, mm -hmm. come in and say, "Oh, we want to we want to do away with this." But there is. But the story gets even more interesting. So, so first of all, it makes no sense to get rid of an expert agency and to throw it over here in an agency with no rulemaking that has to compete with everything else that's going on in, uh, on in the economy uh, and can only deal with unfair or deceptive. Because we're talking about one sixth of the economy, but more importantly, we're dealing with the network that connects six sixths of the economy. But here's what's really bizarre, and the story how the story really gets interesting. We in the FTC brought an action against AT&T. And um, the FTC using their unfair deceptive standard, us using our broader capabilities. And AT&T took the FTC to court and said, you don't have authority. The, stat the FTC statute says that common carriers are exempt from jurisdiction of the FTC. Now, this is the same company that previously in this 
Washington Post article had the head of their Washington office arguing how it should only be the FTC that has jurisdiction over their issues. And the court said, yes, you're right. And not only are you right about the FTC not having jurisdiction over common carriers, the FTC doesn't have jurisdiction over the non-common carrier activities of common carriers. So now we have a situation where the carriers and their supporters at AEI and inside the commission are saying, well, we should transfer everything to the FTC, which is a result of a Ninth Circuit decision on a case brought by the same people that are arguing it should be moved doesn't have the authority. Go figure. But that's not modernization. No, it's, that's, it, just it hiding, is, that's just hiding the people. Yeah, it's like escape velocity. Right. No, no coverage at all. There's this, you may not have heard, but there's a new chairman of the FCC. Really? Yeah. No. Yeah, it just came out. Oh my news. God. Ajit Pai. And, you know, I can't tell who he is because I got these press releases and they seem to be talking about two different guys. So from the NCTA, um, which used to be called the Cable, your cable Association, now it's called the Internet and Te Television Association. Uh, Michael Powell is saying, during his tenure on the commission, Chairman Pai has consistently demonstrated a common sense philosophy that consumers are best served by a robust marketplace that encourages investment, innovation, and competition. We stand ready to assist Chairman Pai to ensure that America remains a global internet communications and entertainment leader. That's one Ajit Pai. The other Ajit Pai, according to Free Press, he's been on the wrong side of just about every major issue that has come before the FCC. During his tenure, he's never met a merger he didn't like or a public safeguard he didn't try to undermine. He's been an, an opponent of net neutrality, expanded broadband access for low-income families, privacy, all kinds of issues. And he's been an, an obstructionist who, get this, has always been eager to push out what the new presidential administration might call alternative facts in defense of the corporate interests he used to represent in the private sector. I listened to a radio interview of you just a couple days ago uh, when you said that uh, C Commissioner Pai canceled all the meetings that you set with him. True. Um, so I had a, when I came in, um, you know, we're, we're a five-person commission. Yeah. And, um, and the, uh, the chairman sets the agenda, and the, and, and the chairman is the CEO, but there's four other commissioners that are important to relate to, and it takes three votes to do anything. So I set up with every commissioner that every other week we had a date on our calendar that, um, that was an hour for the two of us just to sit without staff um, and talk about, you could talk about baseball if they wanted to talk about baseball, um, but talk about the issues of the day and what are the concerns and how do we work our way through serious problems. And, um, and Commissioner Pai and I had, um, had uh, early on a lot of those meetings, but for the last 18, 24 months, he's canceled every meeting. So you know, my, my, the only point I was making on, on Marketplace was that you know, it's, it's hard to work for consensus when you won't sit down with each other. Yeah. Time will tell, I suppose, with the next, the next steps. So a thing that's coming up right away is the AT&T Time Warner merger. And there are two Donald Trumps on this one, too. There's the Donald Trump in October who said this is a you know, destruction of democracy. And then there's a Donald Trump of last week who said after meeting with AT&T, I got to get some more facts. We'll see. Do you have any uh, guesses for us about what's likely to happen with that merger? Well, uh, AT&T has now designed the merger to avoid the FCC. Mm -hmm. um, I think the commission probably still has some jurisdiction, but I don't make those decisions anymore. Um, but, uh, no, my, so as somebody said to me the other day, I have lost the Windex to my crystal ball. Oh, good line. I have determined that you have something in common with Donald John Trump. You may be surprised to hear this. It is the exclamation point, because your first book, Take Command, <laughs> exclamation point, <laughs> leadership lessons from the Civil War, 
So this, have, this is the Harvard Leadership School. You may think it's the Harvard Law School. It's actually the Harvard Leadership School. And I wanted to get your reflections on leadership in this role because I want everybody to understand what it takes to run an agency with a $388 million budget and 1,700 employees. And I thought I could tie this again back to the Civil War and have you talk to us about Ulysses Grant. So you don't have to talk about yourself, but you could talk about General Grant. So, Because that must be a model of leadership for you. I mean, you know, uh, General Grant's my hero. Um, um, uh, and not just because he was from Ohio. Okay. Um, the first chapter in the book that you cited um, is called Dare to Fail. Um, and I think that that's the first rule of leadership. That um, uh, what the book says is that if you, if you prepare for failure, you will no doubt succeed. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that was so great about Grant was that um, he um, was dogged in his, I just won't fail, I'll get this done. So, and, and so he's always been my hero. So my, I've got a little consulting company that I had before the commission and I've just reopened. And it's called Shiloh Group. Huh. And why is it called Shiloh Group? It's called Shiloh Group because it was probably the definitive battle of Grant's career and he lost on the first day. Yeah. He got creamed. And that night, and, and everybody expected him to, the rebels expected him to retreat and melt away. But he didn't. Instead, he brought more troops up. Ewell came in and saved the day. But that night, William Tecumseh Sherman finds Grant sitting under a tree, whittling, working out his frustrations on a piece of wood. And he says, well, Grant, we've had the devil's day. And Grant looks up, whip him tomorrow. And he did. He sure did. And, and persistence is the key. And Ulysses Grant was a great model of persistence. General Lee and General Grant, I'm going to keep going with this, both went to West Point. General Lee graduates top of his class, no demerits. General Grant, number 21 out of 39, plenty of demerits. Comment. <laughs> You're asking the guy who barely got out of Ohio State? <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Moral courage. No, so so, I, I, and, and you know, and you can't you can't criticize Lee. You can criticize yeah. him for being on the wrong side, but you can't criticize him for being a great leader. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, wow, that's a really good question. So look, I think the bottom line is this: it is what you make of things. Let's go back mm -hmm. and let's take <coughs> Ulysses Grant after he left West Point. He distinguished himself in the Mexican War. He met Lee there. He met Lee, but Lee didn't remember. Oh, yeah. um, he, Lee was a hotshot. He was a quartermaster. Uh, he was a, Lee was a hotshot engineer because he, you know, graduated yeah. first in his class. And, um, he then gets posted to various remote posts, particularly out west where. Julia, his wife, can't come with him. And he starts drinking. And he drank himself out of the army. He came back to St. Louis, where his wife, Julia, lived with her, where her parents were, and tried to take up farming. That really didn't work. He was reduced to selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis. 
wearing his old army great coat, selling firewood. He finally went back to work for his father in Galena. And he and his father never really got along that well. To be a clerk in the, in the tannery. Um, he was passed over for early leadership roles in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, McClellan was one of the guys that passed him over. Um, and so failure, 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 and then all of a sudden. And, and so the point is, Okay, right. so you fail. Right. Move on. That's the great leadership lesson of mm -hmm. Ulysses Grant. Another part of this is that Ulysses Grant wrote to his wife Julia every day when he was away from her. And they were both invited to see My American Cousin by President mm -hmm. Lincoln the night of April 14th. Mm -hmm. Julia got spooked, so they left. Mm -hmm. Speaking of leaving went Washington. To, went to Philadelphia. Oh, my segue here. As you walk away from the portals, what's that like? to be the chairman, walk out, and no longer be the chairman. What does that feel like? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, you, you get, you get um, a long time. You get 77 days to work up to it. So it's, not, it's not a big surprise. Right. Um, the, um, you, you know, you walk away with just this incredible gratitude for the fact that at a time of such incredible change in how Americans communicate, that you got to be the guy who sat there and dealt with how Americans relate to those changes. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who say the problem is government are so wrong. I mean, the government is the people. It's where we come together to solve our common problems. And boy, it is a messy process and it's a painful process. But if we can't work things out there, we're in a whole hell of a lot of trouble. And so the fact that I got to sit at the head of that agency in these incredibly changing times and to say, how do you look at these changes in technology, economics, how people connect, um, and make sure the public interest is represented, was a terrific privilege. So I walk away from there proud, and I could do it with the people that I did it with. How fortunate can you be? Mm. And as we're about to think of the, uh, your questions, we're about to turn to uh, Q&A here, but what are you most worried about? There are millions of people marched over the weekend. Mm -hmm. If they knew it, they would be marching about telecom as well. Um, what, what should they be doing? What should people worried about the, f the concentrated market, the high prices, the inadequate service, all of that be doing in America? The most powerful asset of the 21st century are the networks that connect us. Um, networks have always been important. The, net the, you know, the, the railroad drove the Industrial Revolution. Networks have always been, uh, been, been crucial. And the network that will define the 21st century is our broadband network. Um, as I said, we had jurisdiction over one-sixth of the economy, but six-sixths of the economy use that network. And I've always used this phrase that how we connect defines who we are, both commercially and culturally. And so that connection, and whether or not it is going to be controlled on a gateway basis mm -hmm. by essentially four companies, four. Um, is an existential question for American commerce and culture. And, and I am worried about what that future looks like and what is amazing to me 
is how, for, is how the commission and seemingly the Congress want to do things in behalf of these four companies that will have an impact on tens of thousands of other companies and millions of consumers. And I just don't think the debate has gotten to the point where people recognize we're talking about you know fewer than half a dozen companies here, and how should you make policy? And and uh, and that's that's my that's my concern. So there's a public education there's moment. There's a huge public education. Huge opportunity. All right. What do you want to ask Chairman Wheeler? Yes. A mic oh. is flying through the air towards you. It's coming. If you today have been replaced, what about the people who are working under the Civil Rights uh, Commission jobs? What percentage of people in the uh, oh, FCC you mean the civil civil service. Service. Civil are service. government yeah. employees? Mm -hmm. right. And uh, does Trump think that he can just change everybody? Well, I'm the last guy to ask what Trump thinks. <laughs> you do um, have that exclamation point. In the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, but the reality is you're absolutely correct yeah. that, that the vast majority of the uh, employees at the FCC are civil servants. Um, I imagine that the new chairman will bring in, as I did, a new top tier. Um, and, um, and that um, they will be the ones managing those civil servants. Yes. Yeah. They have to you know, follow their directions. Mm -hmm. What do we, the American people, including the people in this room, need to do to protect net neutrality? Well, thank you for asking the question, first of all. Um, I, I think that there are two things. One, um, we need to be heard. Um, uh, but two, we need to be heard in different ways than before. Um, uh, you know, the, the, as Susan says, 3.7 million uh, uh, emails and, and comments to the commission. They were pushing on a door that was already open. The door is locked, latched, bolted, you know, and welded right now. Um, so the battering ram, I think, the battering ram is is to paraphrase, you know, Madison had this great line in Federalist 10 where he said that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And this was the whole concept of how the government was, was, was set up. Economic ambition is what is driving these handful of companies. There must be economic ambition that counters them. And so what we need is we need to hear the voices of those that will be affected. Yes, the small startups but also the big companies, you know, GE, GM, if they're, so let's just go through a couple of things. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, what is it? It is, it is the connectivity of all kinds of database resources. If that connectivity has to worry about gatekeepers, what happens to AI? The Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is going to change the whole economics of the Internet, I believe, from a, from a, from a push environment to a pull, to pull economics. We can talk about that later if you want. But, but, but who will be deciding which things get connected and on which terms? So, so if one of the carriers says, wait a minute, I like my things better, and I'm going to price differently to them than I am this competitive provider of this service, what does it mean? And we've seen they already do that with a zero rating on video. So this is not a hypothetical, you know, awful thing. So, so we need to be making sure that the companies that are affected are delivering the message, because I think that's what the Congress will be most responsive to. Uh, is there a female question? Any, any, any this is great. We answered every question I, in the room. Uh, no, well, uh oh, here I'm she is, over here in the corner. Over. There, in the back. Becca. 
Hey, I think my colleague could probably ask this question better than I could, but I'm just going to do it. Um, so we work at Somerville Community Access Television. Um, so I wanted to know a uh, couple things. One is sort of what is the role, like how uh, can community access television play a, an important role? And what do you think, what do you predict, can you predict? I know our Windex isn't working anymore, but um, what the new uh, chairman, um, what his perspectives are on public access and how we might stay protected? It's great questions. Um, and, um, you know, when I was at uh, NCTA, I was a great supporter of uh, PEG, Public Educational Governmental Access. Um, and we actually got it codified in the 84 uh, uh, Cable Act. Um, and um, uh, things have changed a lot since 84. Um, there have been some intervening legislation, some rulings by the commission. I don't know where Ajit Pai is on that issue. We never, we never had an occasion to discuss it. So I'm, I'm sorry, but good for you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The diversity of voices is, so, so the beauty of technology is that it has created the opportunity for a diversity of voices. That is also the bane of the technology. Because if you are not using things like PEG to express yourself, there are others who are using the opportunities for diversity of voices to do that. And the other thing is that we need to begin to become um, our own editors, where we used to um, outsource the uh, editorial function to uh, NBC or CBS or the New York Times. And now anybody with web access it has as much reach as any of those. And it's going to force consumers to be um, better consumers of information. And I think we'll get there, but we're certainly going through a rough patch right now. Yeah. Uh, Wait a minute. Mike. Uh, first net is uh, Congress's effort to create a fifth cellular network for public safety. Right. We've got three million price sensitive picky cops and firefighters maybe 12 if we stretch it to second responders, but the break even for a network is about 40 million users. In Britain, they said priority preemption and quality of service had to be provided by the carriers. I can't see a way through to success for FirstNet and this network in the country. Do you have any vision of how this will end up? Well, FirstNet has, uh, has been controversial since the day that Congress enacted. It was a decision made by Congress, championed by Senator Rockefeller in particular. Um, and, um, and it has evolved to a point now where they are going to be buying services from an existing wireless provider and will be getting the kind of priority service that you were referencing is available elsewhere in, in other countries. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happened. We had, we had three jobs with regard to FirstNet. One was to make the spectrum available. We did that. Two was to make sure that they had $7 billion to start the process. We did that out of auction revenues. And three was in the coming year, there is uh, the option of states to opt out of FirstNet. And we were to be the judge as to whether uh, a state should be allowed to opt out. And that's a decision that the Pi Commission is now going to have to make. And that's going to be key because, for instance, if New York opts out or California opts out um, or or, or Illinois opts out, or Texas opts out, the nationwide network collapses. Um, and, uh, and that's something we're going to have to live through, and I, I don't know how it's going to end up. Okay. Last question. Anybody? Yes. Um, a question around the wireless spectrum. 
question around uh, wireless spectrum. If one looks at, the, on one side, the, the public uh, benefit, uh, uh, revenues from auctions, uh, being able to just have communication, and on the other side, the rights of uh, spectrum holders. Um, and there's been a lot of controversy in this area with bankruptcies, spectrums that's never used. Um, do you have any thoughts on, do we have the optimal model for how we license or sell and look at sort of the whole uh, life cycle of, of spectrum management over long periods of time and also take into account uh, innovation that occurs? Um. Oh, peeling back that onion, we yeah, could be here, yeah, yeah. you know, till well past dinner time. And mm -hmm. let, me, let me go through a couple of things. One. Um, we have traditionally, well, so spectrum allocation was originally done based on analog physics, okay? So a TV signal is a six megahertz waveform. So you need six megahertz of spectrum to put out a TV station. When you go digital, the efficiencies of digitization allow you to get four or five channels into that same spectrum. But the problem is that everything that, not everything, the vast majority of the spectrum allocation tables were decided using analog physics and we're now in a digital time. So you can get a lot more out of the spectrum, except that it's my spectrum. You can't have my spectrum. They'd rather give up their babies than they, give up They would spectrum. rather, you know, you will, you'll, my cold dead fingers, you right. know, take my spectrum. Um, and, um, and, uh, and this is true internationally. Um, I mean, we had troubles in a, in a big international conference allocating spectrum uh, just last year, or two years ago, I guess. Um, and, um, uh, the world is not as sensitive to this as we are. So that's, that's kind of issue one. We're, we're operating under old rules um, that support, uh, it's, it's, it's mine, I don't want to leave it. One of the great things that the National Broadband Plan uh, came up with, uh, Blair Levin uh, led a team under my predecessor, Julius Janikowski, to develop the National Broadband Plan. You had a large hand in that. Um, was to say there ought to be a spectrum auction where we would repurpose spectrum um, by having an auction to buy it back and then resell it. And, um, and so the broadcast spectrum was the key there because go back to my, if you can, why do you need six megahertz if you can get a bunch of channels in there, get them in there and then sell off the others for, uh, for wireless applications, both licensed and unlicensed, by the way. Um, and um, so just literally, my next to the last day on the job, that auction, which everybody said, oh, it'll never work, it'll never work, that auction hit what was called the final, uh, the, the final stage rule, um, where in fact, we have created a market where uh, broadcasters have agreed to sell 84 megahertz of spectrum, and the wireless carriers have agreed the necessary price to buy that. And so for the next 39 months, um, there will be a whole process across the country of reallocating spectrum, rebanding, um, and making new spectrum available. But the spectrum, you know, I mean, the, the challenge of spectrum is A, they're not making it anymore, and B, uh, is the, the, the physics on the, the, the start, describe the chart, the spectrum allocation chart, uh, our analog physics in a digital era. Here's a shared challenge I think we have that for you, this is blood and guts, entertaining, fascinating stuff. And, and for me, frankly, how, how, do we, how do we reach more people with what are ultimately extraordinarily personal issues? People's phones are very close to their hearts. They would give up a food before they give up a cell phone. What, Thoughts to you, as you give us a benediction here, as you pass into private life, um, how, how do we get the resistance going to focus on these issues in a more dramatic way? You don't ask easy questions. But no, this is important. So, so I've just sat here and given you a wonk's eye view 
of, of telecommunications policy. Um, um, I love my wife dearly, and she loves me, but I can't hold her interest across the dinner table <laughs> on these topics. Okay? So how in the world are we going to hold the, the interest of the, of, of, right. of the vast majority? We need to get out of discussing um, uh, these kind of, uh, this, we need to get out of our technocrat mode yep. and into our mode of Susan's point about how it's the Trump voter who has the worst internet experience and the key to getting an education, to being able to do your homework, the key to being able to get a job, the key to be able to, to, to interact with the world around you is to have broadband, and these people have been denied it. Why? Because we built things around, again, four companies. And we need to be getting the story out that let's talk not about the networks, but let's talk about the network effects. That the effects are the ability to do your homework. The effects are the ability to get a job. The effects are uh, job creation uh, in, in, in New Let me tell you a great story, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a story that more people need to hear. Hal Rogers, who is the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, represents Eastern Kentucky, which is coal country, and which is just, as you know, economically devastated, and Trump made a big play. Uh, in, in, in coal country. But Hal Rogers has said, you know, it's, connectivity is key. And I keep, he brought me, kept bringing me back to the district to pump the importance of, of fiber connectivity, Ms. Fiber. Um, and I'll tell you two stories. I was in McKee, Kentucky, one stoplight, 900 people, fiber to every home and business yeah. as a result of the Obama stimulus. There are more people employed today in McKee than there were three years ago. Yeah. And who's getting employed? It's not just the folks who got let go from the coal mine or those who were selling goods and services to them, but it's the disabled. I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about That's that I'm true. most proud about is what we did to make technology available for individuals who are disabled. But people who can't get out and about are now working for U-Haul and Avis and folks like this being online from McKee, West Virginia. You go down the road to Pikesville, where I met with a bunch of ex-coal miners. I mean, you shake hands with these guys, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> who are now coding for Apple hmm. and, and others, because there's fiber into Pikesville. The community college has fiber, was teaching coding. And these guys who had the gumption to go way underground and go to the coal face had the gumption to say, I'm going to take charge of my life in the new economy because I can, because there is a fiber connection allowing me to do it. Those are the kinds of stories that we have to be telling. because how we connect defines who we are. Well, thank you for helping uh, keep America from being the Pottersville of the internet. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thanks, thank you sir. for your leadership. <laughs> thank you for your character and for the many, many hours you put in on our behalf. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thanks.